as we observe the, what is it, 36th anniversary of the creation of MTV, not exactly a national holiday, but it makes for a very interesting uh, edition of Backlash. Let's bring back someone I had on a few weeks ago, or maybe only two weeks ago, Gavin Edwards, who wrote the book, uh, The Tao of Bill Murray, which we talked about two weeks ago. That's his recent book. But a little, maybe like eight, nine years ago, he wrote a really fun book, which I've read, called VJ, The Unplugged Adventures of MTV's First Wave. Great read, perfect for the beach, perfect for summer reading, especially if you're about my age or somewhere near there and you remember when MTV started, even if you were just a kid. It's really well done, and it's nice to have him on because I like his writing a lot. Gavin Edwards, happy MTV day. Hey, how are you, Adam? I'm good. Um, let's start from the beginning. How did you get started writing this book, uh, which is a book that seems like it had to be made but hadn't been made until you'd done it, did, till you did it? Um, so the VJ's approach to me, uh, that, you know, and it's what, uh, we're talking here about the original uh, – uh, VJs, um, which is uh, Martha Quinn, America's Sweetheart, uh, Nina Blackwood, Alan Hunter, Mark Goodman, and they had meant to do a book uh, years ago, um, and then J.J. Uh, the Jackson, uh, who was also part of the original five, uh, like died suddenly, and it just took the wind out of their sails, and they were too like bummed out uh, to do it. But a few years later, they sort of got back on the horse and said, you know, we had this crazy experience, because like... When MTV launched in 1981, like they were the faces of it, they were the people mm -hmm. like you know talking in this like low rent set, uh, and you know they had this weird uh, like you know brief but intense period of fame, and they said you know like we should get some of this down on paper, um, and they uh, uh, were kicking around and they approached me and I like uh, those were the guys I grew up with. I remember you know sort of like babysitting and uh, you know my family did not have cable which meant that every time i went over to somebody uh -huh. else's house with cable like let's turn on mtv that's and, true know, i didn't have cable either maybe that's why you got into yale i got into harvard and we did pretty <laughs> well academically i mean that was not lost of me and by the way we were both jeopardy champions i got to point out something there i know it's a digression but the first category i had probably wasn't your experiences was tv theme songs and i didn't get any of them but that's probably because really? I didn't watch that much TV growing up, right. which overall makes you probably a better Jeopardy contestant, I would think. <laughs> but I didn't do well in that yeah, category. Yeah, yeah, you know your British poetry, perhaps, but you know, like, but not so mm, good on the theme songs. I knew my that's dictators funny. by birthplace. I think that was the one category I swept in four days. <laughs> but um, what, what um, I found so interesting. I just want to backtrack on something because we're talking yeah. about August first, nineteen eighty-one, but. Very few people noticed that because it wasn't on very many cable systems. As that's a point you make in the book, yeah. and mm -hmm. even in New York City where it was based, like they could go out and be totally anonymous because MTV wasn't on in New York City for MTV a while. MTV was not on in New York City, and it was not on in most of the country. It was in like weird little pockets of places like Tulsa. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, God bless Tulsa. Uh, but, hey, the Gap know, Band's from there, I think. Maybe that <laughs> the city. I believe you are correct. But they wouldn't have been uh, played on MTV, probably, because MTV didn't start playing blacks for a few years, for the most part. Um, that, that, uh, put a pin in that. We can totally come back to that. Um, yeah. And uh, so, uh, you know, they sort of, like, were out, uh, you know, like, uh, they're haggling with, like, uh, cable providers. People, uh, you know, sort of are basically saying, hey, you know, you want us to be on. you got to pay some more money. Um, so uh, for the launch... All, everyone working at MTV like got on a bus and went to like a restaurant in New Jersey, and they're sitting in this basement so they can like watch at midnight, uh -huh. know, sort of like the footage, uh, you know, like John Lack when the executive says, "Ladies and gentlemen, rock and roll," and then you see the footage of like Neil Armstrong jumping around on the moon, and then they mm -hmm. play the Buggles uh, the video, "Kill the Radio Star." But yeah. for a long time, you know, like uh, like Alan Hunter like was working as like a bartender in New York because he didn't know like he thought this was going to be a three month gig and it was going to fall apart and so don't give up your day job. Uh, right. And then eventually it's like oh people are starting to recognize me even though it's not on Manhattan you know sort of like it's time for me to like you know fully commit to this. Yeah, and Martha Quinn was really out of nowhere. I mean the VGs just to give people a background, J.J. Jackson was a little bit older and was a respected uh, music writer at the time. No, and, uh, rock DJ. Uh, rock DJ. I'm sorry, Rock DJ. Yeah. I knew that. Yeah, and, like New uh, Led Zeppelin and like with pals with Rod Stewart and people like that. Mm. And uh, Mark Goodman also had achieved a little bit of success as a rock DJ also, a also a little bit older. Nina Blackwood was somewhere in between, but Martha Quinn was a total unknown just out of college. 
Yeah, uh, Alan Hunter was only a couple years older, and he was like just like an aspiring like Broadway chorus boy who had mm-hmm. not really made it in New York and was just randomly auditioning for things. Martha Quinn was like two months out of NYU, mm-hmm. um, and she had interned at a uh, AM pop radio station in New York, uh, WNBC, and she just randomly dropped by the studio one day on her way home, and somebody looked at her and said, you know you'd be good for this thing they're auditioning for, you know, sort of like, I'm going to send you across town. And she went in for the last day of auditions uh, Mm -hmm. for the VJs and immediately like, oh, my God, we love you. That she was, you know, she knew music, she was young, she was spunky, she was cute, and uh, like, she's our perfect hire. She is the audience, basically. Yeah, and she looked basically the same age because she was not an old-looking 22 at all. Right, yeah, she she felt like a teen. and that's the thing about, like, all the VJs in general. Like, even the older ones, they kind of felt like your pals. Uh, that, you know, it was sort of like a good crew of, uh, you know, like, I'm hanging out with these guys. You know, sort of, and, like, somehow it's easy to watch three or four hours of videos at a time. And they really seemed like they did get along very well. They were like family. They were all in this together, and that meant things like <laughs> using the same bathroom as a changing room. Like, they all had a tiny space. There was nothing glamorous going on. Right. Early I mean, on. it was extremely low rent early on, um, and I would uh, say that you know, like they definitely had like sort of like squabbles, and like Mark will totally cop to the fact that he had like a big superiority uh, mm-hmm. complex. You know, like who are these like kids around me? I will say um, that you know, here we are, you know, thirty plus years down the road, and working with them, I am astonished. They are not all best friends, but they all like each other and they stick mm-hmm. together. And it would be so easy for a group of people like that to just never even be in touch. And like, you know, like 1985, they've all like moved on from the job. I never have to talk to those people again. It's not hard to imagine that. But in fact, like, they the, they have a lot of just kind of like camaraderie. They're, they're like they went through this incredibly weird thing together, and they value that. And J.J. Jackson was sort of a father figure. Part of part of it was his personality, and part of it simply was his age and experience, and knowing everyone in the rock industry, like always welcome at shows. I found it really interesting to find out about him because I didn't know much about him. Yeah, I mean, and that was one of the toughest things uh, to do in the book. That I knew he was such an important guy to them and in the channel. Um, and then making sure that he was represented. Uh, and there was this, uh, uh, I was very, very lucky. Uh, um, I, late in the game as we were putting the book together, found somebody who had interviewed J.J. Um, for a book about his experiences with Led Zeppelin. It was just like a mega Led Zeppelin fan um, who said, like, okay, tell me everything about that time they came to Boston and you drove them around in your station wagon. Mm-hmm. And uh, the guy was kind enough to, uh, let us use the transcripts and God bless JJ. He started off the interview by saying, "Well, let me tell you where I'm coming from." And he gave like sort of like the history of his life up till that time, and mm-hmm. you know just like lots of stuff that maybe he had told the VJs once, like on a coffee break, like late at night, but they no longer remember the details of. So it was really great. You know, he was a guy. You know, he had like been in the Marines. He was working mm-hmm. like doing sort of like uh, computer programming, and then like he like took a correspondence class on how to be a DJ and like got a job, uh-huh. and that eventually turned into being a VJ. I found uh, another surprising um, aspect were just the details of Nina Blackwood's life, because frankly, Alan Hunter, Martha Quinn, and Mark Goodman seemed like really gregarious people, but not inner demons with Nina, but I think she has like elements of shyness about her and the spotlight that she wasn't always 100% comfortable with the way you portrayed her. Nina is an intensely shy person. Uh, that you know, she's like very private. I think uh, more than any of them, like sort of like the degree of like celebrity that she had like weirds her out. Um, and she was sort of like, uh, you know, sort of, uh, of, like rock singers would come on to her and uh, mm-hmm. like she her instant reaction is like, oh, I don't know, I'm uncomfortable, this is weird, you know, it's mm-hmm. like she has all these like kind of sweet, innocent stories about, you know, sort of uh, the adamant, uh, the, like uh, she goes back to this hotel and they sit on the like the floor of the hotel room like eating rice pudding. Mm. Oh, I don't remember that. I remember the John Mellencamp one and he sounded a little creepy in there. Yeah, oh, and John Mellencamp totally like letched on her. They, you know, uh-huh. sort of like invited her to a party at like midnight at like an apartment and uh, she was hanging out with the friends like, that, that's not a, like a party party, that is a party <laughs> for two. <laughs> and he was correct. He came along and you know, she stayed for like a little bit. Like, okay, time for me to go. Yeah. 
And it was funny hearing about Martha Quinn. It seems like she kind of went with the flow more. First of all, she had crushes on a few of the guys. And then friend, our mutual friend, friend of the show, Lenny Dykstra, of course, hit on her on air, which always made it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the stories he told about. He just, uh, I forgot what she was asking, and he was just like, I'm, I'm more into you, Martha, or something like that. Tell that story. <laughs> and, you know, she, like, the, the you know, was like – Desperately hoping that like David Lee Roth would uh, like notice her, and she sort of like looks back at the outfit she wore when she's interviewing him. Well, it's basically like a Boy Scout shirt. She's like, right. No wonder he didn't hit on me. Like, what was I doing? Like wearing that if I wanted him to pay attention to me? Well, based on the stories you tell about Van Halen backstage, I just it's hard to picture America's sweetheart Martha Quinn like <laughs> with David Lee Roth given. The stories you tell about what went on backstage, I think it was the story through Mark Goodman uh, about, right, about you know, whew, it is like, what you would imagine. Yeah, it's exactly what you would imagine. But, I mean, Martha Quinn is one of the, uh, half of one of the great all-time like rock and roll on couples, which is Stiv Bader's. Uh, right. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, she's this like squeaky clean girl in like tennis shoes and he uh-huh. is, you know, like full on, you know, sort of like punk with like chains and mohawk. And uh, uh, the one of the, the great things asking about that, I said, uh, asked her when you guys would like go out uh, for the evening, who would take longer to get ready? She's like, oh, him by like five times. Because <laughs> she's right. like, he's got to put all the gear, he's got to get like the hairspray on. You know, she's basically like pull on a shirt and she's good to go. Um. An interesting aspect that you write about is how much, and Tabitha Storen is at least scheduled to come on the show with what she's yeah. doing now. Uh, you don't even mention her in the book, but they really hated Kurt Loder. So, here's the, like, uh, it's more the, most of them do. And it's not that they uh, so much that they have personal animus uh, towards uh-huh. Kurt that, like, you know, like he didn't, like, run over anybody's dog or anything. Right. Uh, but he represented, uh, like, the change in uh, what happened. Uh, so when they started out, they were the face of MTV. Uh-huh. And um, uh, that meant they're introducing videos. It meant they're giving news breaks. It means if, like, Hall & Oates come by the studio and need to be interviewed, they're the ones doing that. And then at a certain point, uh, like, uh, the powers that be – uh, you know that are gradually trying to like professionalize the operation, and they get mm-hmm. like a, uh, they get a fancier studio. They start giving more notes on how things are happening, um, and they say, "Hey, let's start our own news department." And they brought in Kurt to do that. And so uh, for a lot of the VJs, it was very much, "Oh, this cool thing that we used to get to do is getting taken away from us. We don't get to do the interviews anymore. We don't get to do this part of it." And they resented that, you know, sort of like things that they very much would have liked to do themselves and had trouble getting approval for, like it just seemed to sort of sail through with Kurt. So it didn't seem like they had the same... Kurt didn't do anything to them except be the guy who was like hired at that point. From the book, I mean I didn't I mean you didn't mention Tabitha Sora and I imagine they just viewed her as like a young a reporter almost similar to Martha Quinn, very young looking, all that. Well, uh, she, she's like basically after them. They, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, there's like a little bit of transition with uh, like the next generation, which is uh-huh. uh, like uh, Adam Curry and uh, downtown Julie Brown. Right. Um, and, you know, like Martha said, basically, as far as she's concerned, like those, uh, like, you know, like them and like sort of Kevin Seal, that's basically the only one she considers real VJs. So, you know, she's like, uh-huh. yeah, there are other people on after us, but like, uh, uh, but she thinks of it as a very, very small club. Interesting. What was the most surprising thing when you wrote the book? I didn't. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, um, I think I had no idea that JJ was uh, like the cool guy that he was. Um, mm-hmm. I was, would also tell you, um, I had no idea that it was as low rent in the beginning as yeah. it was. That they were in this uh, crazy, uh, you know, like the meatpacking district at the time. Um, it, it was, you know, sort of like hookers and crime and right. you know, just sort of like, a, you know, like a vast like wasteland on the, like sort of the west side of New York City. And Mark's got stories about, you know, sort of like uh, looking out the window and, you know, like sort of uh, uh, seeing hookers servicing their customers <laughs> uh, and, you know, sort of using one hand to like sort of steal the wallet out of the pants right. and uh, you know, just sort of like uh, um, the, uh, the craziness of the fact that they were making, uh, you know, sort of like uh, a television station that kids all across the country were uh, watching but having no idea of what the circumstances were. What were your favorite – final question I'm going to ask you because i got to let you go soon. Uh, what were your favorite videos during the early days of MTV? The video that made the biggest impression on me uh, – 
you know, like, uh, is always going to be the one I remember from the first night I ever watched MTV, uh, which was uh, Golden Earring, uh, also famous uh, for uh, Radar Love. But yeah. um, they had a hit with uh, a song called Twilight Zone. And oh. it was this, like, crazy sort of mashup of, like, sort of the band and, like, sort of, like, slow motion photography of bullets going through playing cards and, like, what mm-hmm. looked like sort of like a spy movie. And I'm watching this. I'm like, what is this? It was this, like, three and a half minutes of sort of, like, surreal, disconnected images that somehow you could just not take your eyes off. And, like, I huh. saw that. And, uh, like, and after that, like, I was an addict. So, it's a good song. And it's it is a good kind song. Of a violent song, but good one. <laughs> I'll have to check it out again. Uh, final thoughts. Um, let's just sell the book for someone who's looking for something fun to read when they're on vacation in August. Uh, and, uh, and I believe uh, Atria is having a one-day sale uh, today, as people are listening to this on uh, on MTV Day. Um, if they buy it online, there should be oh, a really? discount. Yeah. Mm. No kidding. Uh, but what, what do you think people will like most about the book who are on the fence whether to buy it or not? Um, I think if the uh, uh, it's going to be great like action there was behind the scenes and you know sort of like the, just a constant parade of celebrities coming through and MTV was at the center of the universe in those years Gavin Edwards uh, people can follow you uh, under at Mr. Gavin Edwards just MR Gavin Edwards on Twitter uh, you have an active account and the book again is VJ the unplugged adventures of MTV's first wave I highly recommend it it's a fun read and uh, I really appreciate your coming on with me today Thanks, on Adam. MTV day Always a good talking to you